Welcome to Walking the Half Torah. I'm Tyler Merwin, and this is Torah portion told out. This week's Torah portion is Genesis 25:19 through 28:9, and our half Torah this week is Malachi 1:1 through 2:7. Toldot means generations, as in our opening line of the Torah portion, which reads, "These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son." Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was four years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban the Aramean, to be his wife. This week's Torah portion primarily focuses on Esau and Jacob, or Esav and Yaakov. So let's do a recap of our Torah portion. Our portion opens with Isaac praying for Rebekah, because she has been barren for the 20 years that they have been together. Adonai entreats his prayer, and she conceives, but she is concerned because of the struggle that's going on within her womb. Adonai tells her that there are two nations in her womb and that the older will serve the younger. Esau, the red one, is born first, hairy all over. That's kind of picture a baby with a beard, one of the weird uh, filters or something on your phone. Jacob is born next, grasping the heel of his brother. Esau grew up to be a man of the field, a hunter of flesh, and Isaac favored him because he ate of his game. Must have been a really good cook. And Jacob grew up a wholesome man, abiding in tents, and Rebekah favored him. As he continued to grow up, Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of red stuff, for Esau cared about the desires of his flesh over the weightier spiritual matters. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Next, there was a famine in the land, and Isaac heads to Gerar, in the land of King Abimelech of the Philistines. Isaac uses the same trick as his father, saying Rebekah is his sister, for fear that the locals would kill him and take her. Isaac is told to stay in this land and not to go to Egypt. And the ruse is busted when Abimelech sees Isaac and Rebekah acting flirtatiously with one another. So Abimelech called to Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought, lest I die because of her. Genesis 26, verse 9. So the king orders protection over both of them under penalty of death. Isaac is very prosperous in the land and becomes very wealthy, and the Philistines become very envious of that wealth. Isaac is asked to move away from them, so he moves to the valley of Gerar. He redug the wells of Abraham his father and gave them the same names. Abimelech and the commander of his army visit Isaac and make a covenant of peace with him. Next, the text tells us that when Esau was 40 years old, he took two wives from the Hittites, and they were a source of bitterness to Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac is now a hundred years old, and the Torah tells us that his eyes were dim so that he could not see. We've discussed this before, but we think this is likely referring to both the physical and a spiritual state, as he is set on giving the blessing to Esau, the man of flesh, instead of Jacob, the man of the spirit. So Isaac sends Esau out to hunt some fresh game and make a meal for him so he can give him the blessing of the firstborn. Rebekah, knowing what's happening, has Jacob disguise himself as Esau while she cooks up the food Isaac likes. Jacob is hesitant, but he does follow the command of his mother. Jacob goes into the tent of his father in disguise and pretends to be Esau. Isaac is suspicious but blesses him anyway with this prophetic blessing. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Genesis 27, 28-29 As soon as Jacob leaves, Esau returns from his hunt. Isaac is stunned 
and Esau is in tears that the blessing had been given to Jacob had been given to Jacob instead of Esau. So Esau hated Jacob and vowed to himself that he would kill Jacob after their father had passed away. Rebekah makes plans to send Jacob away to her brother Laban and her family within Haran while Esau cools down. Isaac blesses Jacob and sends him away to Haran to get a wife from there, just as Abraham had brought Rebekah to him, for they loathed the pagan wives of Esau. Esau, finally seeing that his wives were very loathsome to his parents, takes another wife, this time from Ishmael. Not really sure if that's a step up or a step down, but at least it's a different step. Now let's jump into this week's half Torah. Malachi, or Malachi, 1, 1 through 2, 7. Malachi was thought to be the very last prophet of the Tanakh and was thought to have prophesied after the construction of the second temple. He was a contemporary with the prophets Haggai and Zechariah and was also a member of the Great Assembly, which, among other things, fixed the Jewish biblical canon, which would be our Old Testament and the Tanakh as we know them today. Malachi means my messenger. And as we have mentioned before, the word malach means messenger, which can be a heavenly messenger, which we know as an angel, or it could just be a human messenger. The context of how it's used is how we know how to translate it as angel or human. The Oracle of the Word of yod heh to Israel by Malachi. Malachi 1.1 even though the people he is directly addressing are those that return from the Babylonian captivity, the kingdom of Judah, Adonai addresses them with the term Israel, which is more of an all-inclusive and one that transcends time. I have loved you, says yod heh vav but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares yod heh vav yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, We are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, Yodhevavi of hosts says, They may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country, and the people with whom Yodhevavi is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is yod heh beyond the border of Israel. Verses 2-5 through five. Here we can clearly see the tie into our portion, Jacob and Esau. The Holy One is saying that he loved Jacob, but hated Esau. As we've discussed before, that these words don't quite have the same meaning that we use today in our English language. Though in some context, it can be close. The classic example I like to use is Jacob and his two wives, Leah and Rachel. The Torah tells us that Jacob loved Rachel, but he hated Leah. Well, we know he didn't hate Leah like we would commonly use the word today. We could see that he loved Rachel more than Leah and had preferred her over Leah. But it wasn't like a bitter divorce, ugly battle kind of a thing that we would picture with the word hate. The first use of the word love, which is achava in Hebrew, is in the story of the Akeda, where Abraham is told to take his Isaac, his son, whom he loves, ahava, to be an olah offering. The second use is in last week's Torah portion, Chai Sarah, where Isaac meets his bride, Rebekah, and he takes her into his mother's tent, and he loved her, or ahava. Both of these examples demonstrate a deep fondness, but also a positive destiny for Israel. The first use of the word hate, sane, is also in Chai Sarah, when Rebekah's family blesses her as she leaves to go meet Isaac. They state, May your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Hate can be rendered as unfavored or against, without any emotional attachment. So another way to state that would be, may your offspring possess the gate of those who are against him. The Holy One loved Jacob because Jacob was a tome man, 
which is Tav Mem, which actually means to be complete, perfect, wholesome, morally upright, pious, or having integrity. Jacob was focused on the covenant, while Esau was focused on his flesh. Remember, this goes back to the sixth day of creation, where the beast was the firstborn and man was the secondborn, which represents the spiritual side. We all have a Jacob and an Esau inside of us, the spirit and the flesh. The flesh is only truly evil if it's left unchecked and allowed to rule our lives. But if it's under control of the spirit, the flesh provides the necessary functions we need in our life. Adonai himself set this all in order as we are reminded in Romans 9, 11 through 13. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of the works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. God foreknew the characters that each would have, and he alone can declare what will be before it happens. Adonai was angry with Edom, or Esau, because he rejoiced in Israel's captivity in Egypt, and he did not show them courtesy after the exodus, even though they were supposed to be brothers. Our text now turns from Esau and Edom and back to the shortcomings of Israel. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says yod heh of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? Verse 6. The prophet's rebuke is aimed first at the priesthood, as correction always starts with leadership. By offering polluted food upon my altar, but you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that yod heh table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those who, that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show, favor, show you favor? Says yod heh of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you? Thus says yod heh of hosts. Verses 7 through 9. yod heh Bab-Heh's table is an idiom for the holy altar and the holy temple. Leviticus 22, 22 states, An animal blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scabs you shall not offer to yod heh or give them to yod heh as a food offering on the altar. Only perfect animals, without defect, are permissible on his holy altar, because that's the state in which he created them in the beginning. Sin and the fall of man is what brought about corruption and these defects. And since these defects symbolizes that corruption and sin, it is never acceptable to the Holy One as a sacrifice. Malachi even points out that they wouldn't offer such a defective animals to their earthly governors, yet they have the gall to offer it to the Holy One of Israel. How can we expect the favor of the King of Kings if we don't show him the honor he deserves? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says yod heh of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says yod heh of hosts. Verses 10 and 11. Adonai would prefer that the door of his temple would be closed rather than to bring tainted offerings. This also applies to our heart. 
For even if the animals are offered without defect, if the one bringing the offering is in sin, or not doing it with joy or with love to the Father, then it is just as tainted as a physical defect. God's people that are scattered in the nations that don't have access to the Holy Temple still offer an incense of prayer and praise that is acceptable to the Holy One. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, that its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says yod heh bab of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand? Says yod heh bab -Heh. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says yod heh bab of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Verses 12 through 14. Now the focus turns from the Kohanim to the people. Even the people have an attitude that what Elohim requires is too burdensome, and they are complaining just like Israel complained in the wilderness. Some are even stealing sacrificial animals, which would never be acceptable. And the next example is someone having and vowing a perfect animal for sacrifice, but instead substituting it for a blemished one. Both of these cases have have to assume that they have forgotten the omnipotent God that they serve, who sees our every move and discerns our every thought. yod heh -Vav -Heh will be feared among the nations, but Israel is meant to be his example for the nations. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says yod heh -Vav -Heh of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring, and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. Malachi 2, verses 1-3 through 3. Obedience to Adonai and his sacrificial system brought blessings and prosperity to his people, but their disobedience will bring curses in the place of the blessings. Where my translation says, I will rebuke your offspring, the Hebrew word here for offspring is actually seed. Though translating seed as offspring is one way of interpreting this passage. The sages see this as referring to the literal seed of grain, which would point to a curse on their food supply. Since the sacrifices are referred to as food for the Holy One, the punishment would be on the food for the people. The dung reference is one of disgrace and humiliation, since they had disgraced Adonai. So you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says yod heh -Vav -Heh of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. Malachi 2, 4 and 5. God is letting them know that he is not breaking the covenant he made with Aaron, the priesthood, and the service of the temple with Levi. Adonai made covenants with Aaron and his grandson, Pincus, whom he had made the covenant of peace with after his actions against the treacherous acts of Zimri and Cosby. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is a messenger of yod heh -Vav -Heh of hosts. Malachi 2, verses 6 and 7. The prophet is contrasting uprightness of the priesthood in the beginning to his current state. 
True instruction in Hebrew is emet Torah, or truth Torah, which would be a purity of heart, mind, and action when administering the Torah. A priesthood, a leadership who is acting righteously, like Aaron and the priesthood of old, will keep many from sin or keep them out of iniquity. And remember that the Kohen Gadol ministers directly to the Holy One on Yom Kippur in the Holy of Holies. And he and the rest of the priesthood are to guard the Torah of truth and properly minister that to the people. Our Torah portion deals with Jacob and Esau. Here we see that Aaron and Pinchas are compared to Jacob, who is righteous and upright, though not flawless. While the generation Malachi is speaking to is being compared to Esau. And while this rebuke is something for each one of us to consider and to take account of our own lives and service, it's especially true to those of us who are in leadership. Let's not take lightly the service placed upon us by the Holy One of Israel to walk as Yeshua, our Master, walked and to lead as He led. Yeshua is Emet Torah. Let us all follow him. I pray this teaching has been edifying to you. Let's lift up the name of the Holy One with love in Esad. Shalom.